Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. So before we get into today's video, I just wanted to go ahead and give a big thank you to today's sponsor, which is Function of Beauty. Now, self-care is so important, especially during these times. Everyone has been stuck at home for months and may still be stuck at home, but it's so important not to forget that you still deserve to be pampered and not let yourself slip into a funk from having nothing to do. With Function of Beauty, you fill out a quick two-minute quiz outlining your hair type, hair goals, and personal preferences. You even get to pick the color, the scent, and even how strong you want the scent, and you get to pick the name that goes on the bottle. There are no parabens, no sulfates, it's GMO free, there's no toxins, and it is 100% vegan and cruelty free. I think the packaging is so freaking cute, and I got my name on the bottle right here, if you can see it. And I got to pick the color and I absolutely love the color of these. I've been using it for about a month and a half now and I freaking love the results. So it comes with this little um, note card packet that shows you kind of exactly what you ordered. Um, so my hair profile is curly, medium thickness, and dry. The goals that I put down are anti-frizz, curl definition, deep condition, hydrate, and shine. And then for scents, for both of them, I chose the scent Cherry Blossom, which I absolutely love. If I were going to pick any of them, I absolutely recommend Cherry Blossom. It's absolutely delicious. I freaking love that scent. The other product that I got besides the shampoo and conditioner was the deep conditioning mask, which also has my name right on the bottle. If you can see it. Like I said, I love the scent Cherry Blossom. I highly recommend that scent, but also, as you can probably tell, my hair is very long, which means that it requires a lot of upkeep. I also dye it all the time, so there's a lot of damage that I do to my hair all the time. I also don't have hair that grows very easily. I know some people with long hair, it just grows and they have to cut it every three months to keep it at a good length. This took me like five years to get to it, so I really need to make sure that I'm constantly hydrating it. I'm taking good care of it because otherwise it gets just dry and frizzy and gross. If I don't take care of it properly, then it just does not look good. So I need the best possible products to keep my hair under control and looking nice. And let me tell you, the very first time that I used it, I saw improvements in my hydration, in my curl. I saw less frizz. I've actually been getting a lot of comments on my recent videos of people telling me that they like my hair and it's all because of function of beauty. I love my formula. I think it's made my hair really nice and curly. My hair is so long that, you know, even though I have naturally curly hair, a lot of products just weigh it down even more and make it look more wavy or kind of awkward instead of these nice curls and these nice waves that I have. You can definitely see that it's a lot more curly than it used to be. If you go back in my previous videos from maybe a couple months ago, it's a lot more flat, it's a lot less voluminous, there's a lot less curl, and that's just because I wasn't using the right products on my hair. And I do have to say, my favorite part of all of this is gotta be the hair mask because, you know, I saw some really good results with the shampoo and conditioner, but this just took it to the next level. When I stepped out of the shower, I let my hair air dry, and, you know, after I used this, I had spirals, and this is a day after I washed my hair, so it's a little bit less curly and voluminous, but after I used this mask, oh my goodness, I freaking loved it. So I definitely recommend the shampoo, conditioner, and the hair mask if you want nice, hydrated, full, and healthy looking hair. The leave-in treatments, the masks, and the hair serums are all 100% customized by each order. It's also really convenient because they offer a subscription service which delivers your favorite products however often you want, whether it be every month, every two months, every three months, etc. Now, the good news that I am so excited about is that if you use the link down below, you can get 20% off of your first order. Shipping is available to the countries listed here, so again, make sure to click the link down below for 20% off of your unique personalized hair care products that are vegan and 100% cruelty free. Thank you once again to Function of Beauty for sponsoring today's video. So with all of that being said, let's just get right into today's case. 
Now, today's case is one that is very, very difficult to listen to. There are a lot of graphic and uncomfortable details to listen to, and I'm gonna do my best to not make those details overly graphic or go into too much detail about all of this, but I need to explain what happened so that you can fully understand what this poor little girl went through. So again, this case is extremely disturbing. I honestly felt sick while I was researching it. I almost didn't even want to cover this case because of how disturbing it is, but I think that this little girl deserves for her story to be told. I think that we can all hear this story and learn something from it. But again, please use this as your warning if you are very sensitive to crimes against children or graphic details or anything like that. This is not the video for you, so I just wanted to make sure, go ahead and say that, put it out there um, before we get into today's video. So with all of that being said, let's just get right into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the horrendous, brutal murder of Shanda Scherer. Shanda Scherer was born June 6, 1979 in Pineville, Kentucky to her parents Jacqueline Vaught and Stephen Scherer. Now, when Shanda was pretty young, her mother and father got a divorce. Jackie remarried and moved the family to Louisville, Kentucky when she was in fifth grade. Shanda would spend both fifth and sixth grade here attending St. Paul School. She was involved in cheerleading, volleyball, softball, and by all accounts, she was very happy here. However, Jackie would become divorced once again, so she moved the family again to New Albany in Indiana in June of 1991 so that she could be closer to her father and see him more often. While there, she went to Hazelwood Middle School, then transferred to Our Lady Perpetual Help School, which is a Catholic school also in New Albany. Obviously, moving around like this can be very difficult for a young girl, but Despite this, those around Shanda described her as being happy, outgoing, bubbly, and popular. She made friends very easily and adapted very quickly. She got good grades, did all of her homework, stayed out of trouble, and was just overall an excellent student. She was very close to her father and her stepmother and was best friends with her mom. Now, let's talk about Shanda's time at Hazelwood Middle School. Very early on, Shanda met a girl named Amanda Hervin. They had gotten into a pretty intense physical altercation which landed them both in detention. However, while while in detention, the two actually became very close friends and eventually their relationship led them to being more than just friends. They started to exchange love letters back and forth and became very infatuated with each other. Now, as all of this was going on, Shanda's mother Jackie noticed that her grades started to slip and she didn't necessarily love the relationship that she had with Amanda, so she wanted to go ahead and keep a close eye on them. At this time, she kind of just thought that Amanda was a bad influence on Shanda. By October, Amanda and Shanda went to to their school dance together, but not everything at the school dance was all butterflies and rainbows to say the very least. At the dance, Amanda's jealous ex-girlfriend Melinda Loveless confronted the two because she was jealous of their new relationship. Just seeing the two together made Melinda absolutely furious and she tried to get into a fist fight with Shanda but Amanda stopped her. So as we go through this video, I am kind of going to be introducing several different names, and as I do, I kind of want to pause so we can get to know each girl. So let's first talk a little bit about Melinda Loveless. Melinda was born in New Albany in 1975 and was the youngest of three sisters. Melinda's father, Larry, was drafted into the U.S. Army during the Vietnam War and was known as a war hero when he returned. However, her mother, Marjorie, was known to be sort of a sexual deviant around the town. She was known to always wear her daughter's underwear and makeup. She would constantly cheat on her husband and she enjoyed watching others in the act. Larry worked different jobs after he returned back from the service. He first worked at the Southern Railway and then became a probation officer with the New Albany Police Department in 1965, but he only worked there for eight months before he was fired. Him and his partner had assaulted an African-American man who Larry thought was sleeping with his wife. 
He then became a mail carrier, but this job did not last either. He only worked there for three months because while he did, he really didn't deliver all of the mail. He would go on his routes, but then he would just bring most of the mail home and destroy it so that he didn't have to deliver it. Marjorie also worked several different jobs, but she never really stuck to anything. The family was considered an upper middle class family when both parents were working. However, Larry was known to use most of the money he made on himself. He didn't really spend it on the family. He more so just focused on buying guns, motorcycles, cars, before filing for bankruptcy in 1980. And this is when we kind of learn a lot more about how Melinda and her sisters were being treated at the home. Other extended family members would often say that Melinda and her sisters were often hungry, being left alone at the home for extended periods of time, and were not being fed properly. Instead of being home and raising their daughters, it seemed like Marjorie and Larry were more concerned with going out and having orgies and trading off partners with other couples and being swingers and things like that. There were also several times when Marjorie tried to take her own life. Now, when Melinda was only nine years old, Larry allowed her mother Marjorie to be gang- after this, of course, Marjorie refused to sleep with her husband, but only a month after the gang Larry himself decided to rape his wife while their three children listened in from another room. In the summer of 1986, Larry had beat Marjorie so bad that she was hospitalized and he was charged and convicted of battery. Now, we don't know exactly how much Melinda herself was abused by her parents, but given what we know, it seemed pretty bad. So some accused Larry of beating Melinda when she was just an infant. Now, some of Melinda's older siblings had said that he molested them as well, and one of Melinda's cousins actually testified that he molested her from the ages of 10 to 14 but Melinda herself had denied any abuse whatsoever, but her cousin told a different story. Her cousin Teddy had testified in court that she witnessed Larry tying up all three of his daughters and then raped each one one by one, but neither Melinda or her sisters cooperated this account, but what was completely undeniable was that he did verbally and emotionally abuse his daughters. There was one incident where he fired a handgun right next to Melinda's older sister's head, missing her on purpose, but the threat was still obviously there. Then in 1990, Larry was caught spying on Melinda and a friend. Marjorie attacked him with a knife, which sent him to the hospital before trying to kill herself in front of her daughters. Finally, after all of this, a lifetime of abuse and fighting with Marjorie and doing this, these disgusting things back and forth, Larry filed for divorce and then moved to Florida. But Melinda was extremely upset by this and she honestly felt betrayed. Larry would write her letters until he eventually just cut off all contact with her. Obviously, we can see that Melinda had a very, very dysfunctional family and suffered abuse her entire life. So it seems that violence and anger is all Melinda knew. She began secretly dating Amanda Hervin in 1990, and that was around the same time that her father left. She started getting into fights at school and was reporting to her teachers and other staff that she was very depressed. She did start counseling, but as we will find out later, it didn't really seem to help much. By March of 1991, Melinda finally told her mother that she was gay and was dating another girl. And at first, her mother was very, very upset, but she did eventually grow to accept her daughter's sexual orientation. Then, as things do when you are very young, over time, the relationship between Melinda and Amanda declined, and the two broke up after about a year of dating. That brings us back to October of 1991, when she saw Amanda and Shanda at the school dance. 
So in the weeks after seeing the two at the school dance, Melinda started to threaten Shanda publicly. She had also started writing letters to Amanda saying that she wanted Shanda dead. It was also at this point that Shanda's parents discovered letters that her and Amanda had been writing back and forth. I don't know exactly how public their relationship was. I don't know if she had ever came out to her parents. I don't think she had but her parents were very shocked when they saw just how sexually explicit their letters between the two were. So by the end of November, Shanda was transferred to the Our Lady of Perpetual Help Catholic School. But as you can imagine, this did not stop Shanda and Amanda from being together. Amanda continued to write Shanda letters and would call her at home, but the longer that Shanda was away at school, the more detached their relationship became. Shanda was at a new school, she was making new friends, and she wasn't paying as much attention to Amanda as Amanda would have liked. This is when things take a major turn for the worst, but before I get into what happened, I want to talk a little bit more about some of the other girls that Melinda was friends with, who will soon be very important to this case. First, we have Lori Tackett. She was born in Madison, Indiana in 1974. She grew up in a very fundamentalist Pentecostal Christian household led by her mother, and her father was a factory worker who was convicted of two separate felonies in the 1960s. Just like Melinda, Lori seemed to have a very, very rough time from the very beginning. Lori had claimed that she was at the ages of 5 and 12. Since her mother was such a fundamentalist Christian, she had expectations of what her daughter would wear to school every single day. However, Lori would change into jeans out of whatever clothes that her mother put her in once she got to school. In May of 1989, Lori's mother found out what she was doing, that she was changing um, when she got to school, so her mother confronted her about this, which resulted in her mother strangling her. As a result, social workers started visiting the house unannounced to make sure that there was no abuse happening in the household, but we really don't know how much abuse was actually happening behind closed doors. Either way, whether we know how much abuse was happening or not, Lori and her mother did not get along whatsoever. Understandably, eventually, by the time that she was 15 years old, she started acting out more and eventually started becoming obsessed with the occult and paranormal activity and vampirism. She would pretend to be possessed by the spirit of Deanna the Vampire and started using Ouija boards at her friend's houses, which goes directly against what her mother believed, so of course, Using the Ouija boards and doing these types of activities caused a lot of tension between her and her mother. She started to become involved in self-harming, especially after she had began dating another girl who also self-harmed. Her parents found out about her self-harming and she was sent to a mental hospital in March of 1991. She was released from the hospital and prescribed antidepressants but only two days later, her and her girlfriend, Tony Lawrence, who we will talk about in just a minute, self-harmed so bad that she was sent directly back to the hospital. She was sent to the psych ward and she was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, which is not the same thing as disassociative identity disorder, which it usually gets confused with. BPD basically means that you have a very, very unstable emotional state and you have a lot of trouble with things like long-term friendships, appropriate professional relationships, long-term romantic relationships, and family relationships. It involves reacting to certain situations in extreme emotional ways and having a very distorted view of oneself. She had also admitted to workers in the psych ward that she did have a history of experiencing hallucinations since she was a very young girl. By April, she was discharged from the hospital, then subsequently dropped out of high school that September. She moved out of the family home and started bouncing around between different friends' homes by October of 1991. In November of that year, she met and became very fast friends with Melinda Lovelace. She had been spending most of her time with Melinda by the end of that year. So now let's talk about Tony Lawrence, who I just mentioned before. 
Tony was born in 1976, and we don't know too much about her childhood like we did with the two previous girls. She was best friends with a girl named Hope Rippey from the time that she was a very young child. She was abused by an unnamed relative when she was only nine years old and was by a teenage boy when she was 14 years old. From the sound of it, this teenage boy did not get into much trouble besides being told to stay away from Tony, which is unfortunate, but it is all too common in our society. She began going to therapy for counseling after this happened, but she did not stick with it. She too began experimenting sexually. She began self-harming and had attempted to take her own life in eighth grade. So the last girl that I want to talk about is named Hope Rippey. Hope was born in 1976 in Madison, Indiana. Her parents divorced when she was seven years old and she moved away with her siblings and her mother to Quincy, Michigan for three years. Her parents got back together three years later in 1987. She moved back and started up her friendship with her long-term childhood friend, Tony Lawrence, and started being friends again with Lori Tackett. However, her parents had always thought that Lori was a very bad influence and did not love the fact that they hung out. When she was 15 years old, she too began self-harming with her friends. Other than that, we don't know too much more about Hope's background, but at least we have a little bit of an insight into each girl. So now that we have a little bit of a better idea of each girl's background, we can sort of understand the type of mindset that they were in when all of this happened. None of them had a great upbringing, and especially with them all meeting each other, it seemed like everyone sort of fed into each other's energy, creating a ton of more problems that probably would have never existed if they had never met each other. So on the bitterly cold night of January 10th, 1992, 17-year-old Lori, 15-year-old Hope, and 15-year-old Tony all drove together in Lori's car from Madison, Indiana to New Albany to Melinda's house to pick her up with the plans of attending a rock concert. Now, this was Lori's first time meeting Tony, and when they picked up Melinda, this was Tony's first time also meeting Melinda, and Hope had only met Melinda a time or two before that, so they didn't know each other too well either, but either way, all of the girls seemed to get along together very well, very quickly. All of the girls were starting to try on and borrow some of Melinda's clothes when Melinda pulled out a kitchen knife. She told the girls that she just wanted to go to Shanda's house to scare her with the knife. Now, neither Tony or Lori had previously met Shanda, but they had already known about the plan to go ahead and scare her because Lori had told Tony on the way that they were going to mess with this younger girl. Melinda had explained to Tony and Lori that she did not like Shanda because she was a copycat and she stole her girlfriend. So they all hopped back into Lori's car where Hope drove, and they all drove to Jefferson, Indiana, where Shanda stayed with her dad on the weekends. On the way, they had stopped at the McDonald's to ask for directions since, you know, GPSs weren't on every cell phone like they are today. They got to Shanda's phone just before dark at around 8 p.m. Now, Melinda was hiding on the floor of the car because she knew that if Shanda had seen her, that Shanda would get scared and wouldn't go with them. So Melinda had told Hope and Tony to go knock on Shanda's door, introduce themselves as friends of Amanda, and then ask her to come with them so that they could go to see Amanda, who was waiting for them at Mistletoe Falls, an old stone house on an isolated hill in Utica overlooking the Ohio River. Now, Shanda did not know either Tony or Hope, but she did want to go see Amanda. However, she told the girls that she could not go with them because her parents were awake, so she told them to come back at around midnight when her parents would be asleep so that she could sneak out to go with them. Of course, Melinda was angry that she wasn't coming with them right away, 
but she was fine with coming back later because the other girls were confident that Shanda would come and go with them. So the girls headed over to Louisville to go and attend their rock concert. They saw the band Sunspring at the Audubon State Park near I-65. However, Tony and Hope didn't really want to stay at the concert. They weren't all that interested in the music, so they left the concert and then went back to Lori's car so that they could do some stuff in Lori's car with some boys that they met at the concert. After the concert, all of the girls left and went back to Shanda's house. As they were driving, Melinda told everyone else that she could not wait to kill Shanda, but the girls were under the impression that they were just going to use the knife to scare Shanda. No one else in the car had ever intended to kill her or knew of any plan to kill her either. Hope and Lori were still kind of naive and just thought that Melinda wanted to scare Shanda, but Tony was starting to get really worried and started to realize that this could be a lot more serious than she thought. So when they returned to Shanda's house at around 12.30 a.m., Tony did not want to be the one to go back up and get her, so Lori and Hope went up to the door to see Shanda as Melinda hid under a blanket in the back seat with her knife. So when Hope told Shanda that Amanda was still at the witch's castle, which I guess is what they called the stone house that they were going to, Shanda wasn't too sure if she wanted to go with them at first. However, she was convinced by these girls to go with them. Shanda went off to go change her clothes and she reluctantly left to go and get in the car. Just as she got in, Hope started berating Shanda with questions about her relationship with Amanda. It was at this point that Melinda sprung from the back seat grabbed Shanda's hair and then put the blunt end of the knife up to Shanda's throat and started questioning her about her sexual relationship with Amanda. Shanda was obviously terrified and was just screaming and begging Melinda not to hurt her. Melinda just yelled, shut up, and just kept asking questions about the relationship. As all of this was happening, they just continued driving towards Utica to Witch's Castle. Once they got there, Shanda was still absolutely hysterical, but they dragged her inside and bound her arms and legs with rope. Melinda started saying things like, oh, you have such pretty hair. I wonder how pretty you would be if someone just cut it all off. Melinda started to take off Shanda's rings on her hands one by one and started handing them to each of the girls. Hope then took off Shanda's Mickey Mouse watch and started playing the little song that comes on it and started dancing to the song. Lori started telling Shanda that Witch's Castle is where they burn witches and that it is filled with dead bodies and that she was going to be next. Then Lori went out to the car and got a t-shirt with a smiley face on it and lit it on fire directly in front of Shanda's face for her to see. However, as the shirt burned, the girls got scared that one of the passing by cars would see it, so they left the house and took Shanda with them. They got back into the car and as they drove, Shanda continued to plea with the girls to just please take her back Home. Then Melinda told Shanda to take her bra off and give it to Hope. Hope then took off her own bra and then put on Shanda's bra all as she was driving the car. They then started to get lost, so they covered Shanda with a blanket and stopped at a gas station. Lori went inside to ask for directions while Tony called a boy on the phone to help her calm down, but she did not tell this boy about what was going on. They then got back in the car and started driving around. They drove around for a bit before ending up in some backwoods near Lori's house. Lori then led the girls to a garbage dump off of a logging road in the forest. Tony and Hope were scared, so they stayed in the car. This is where they start torturing Shanda, and at this point, it gets very intense, and it is not something that is pleasant or easy to hear, so if you need to skip this part, I totally understand, but I will try my best to give you all the details that you need to know without being overly graphic or gruesome or anything like that. So Melinda and Lori made Shanda take off all of her clothes before Melinda started punching her. Then Melinda slammed Shanda's face into her knee, cutting her lip open with her own braces. Melinda attempted to slit 
Shanda's throat, but the knife was too dull. Hope then came out of the car to help hold Shanda down, and this is when Melinda and Lori took turns stabbing Shanda in the chest. They then strangled her until she was unconscious, and then they put her in the trunk of the car. After this, they drove to Lori's house to clean themselves up and drink some pop. They then heard Shanda screaming in the trunk, so Lori went outside and stabbed her several more times. So then Lori came back in the house and washed herself off again. They then hung out for a bit casually until around 2.30 when Lori and Melinda got back in the car and started driving around. As they were driving around in a nearby town called Cannon, Shanda started crying and was making gurgling noises still from the trunk. Shanda was an absolute fighter and just kept fighting through everything that happened to her, but after hearing all of these noises, they stopped the car and opened the trunk. When they did so, Shanda sat up and she was in horrible condition and she could not speak. So Lori beat her once again with a tire iron until she was silent again and then they got back in the car and just started driving around again. Melinda and Lori returned to Lori's house once again to clean up. Hope asked her about Shanda and Lori just started laughing and describing everything that just happened. The girls were talking and laughing so loud that they woke up Lori's mother. So she yelled at Lori for bringing friends over and for being out so late. So Lori told her mother that she would go ahead and drive her friends home. But instead of driving them home, they just drove to a burn pile. They opened the trunk to take one last look at Shanda, but Tony refused to look at her. This is when Hope sprayed Shanda with Windex and said, you're not looking so hot now, are you? So then the girls drove over to the gas station, put some gas in the car, and then got a two liter of Pepsi. Then Lori dumped out the two liter and filled it with gas. They then drove up north past Madison, then past Jefferson Proving Ground to Lemon Road off of US Route 421 to an area that Hope knew of. They pulled off and parked the car. While Tony waited in the car, Lori and Hope took a blanket and wrapped Shanda in the blanket. At this point, Shanda was still alive. They took Shanda and carried her out to a gravel road, and again, it gets really bad here, and this is your next warning to skip if you need to. But at this point, Lori instructed Hope to pour gas on Shanda and light her on fire, and they left. However, Melinda was still worried that Shanda was not dead yet, so they came back a little bit later and poured more gas on her. At this point, it was the next morning, and the girls went to McDonald's at around 9.30 a.m. to eat breakfast. As they were eating, they just sat there and laughed about what happened. They had absolutely no remorse for what happened and were just joking about the fact that she looked like the food that they were eating. Lori then drove Tony and Hope back to their respective homes and then finally went back to her home with Melinda. Right away, Melinda called Amanda and told her that they had just killed Shanda and planned to pick up Amanda later that day. Another friend of Melinda's, Crystal Wallen, then came over to Melinda's house and they told her what happened. All three of them then drove over to pick up Amanda's house to bring her back to Melinda's house where they told Amanda everything that happened. Neither Crystal or Amanda really believed them until Lori went and showed them the trunk of the car where it all happened, where there was still blood everywhere, and where Shanda's socks still were. And of course, at this site, Amanda was absolutely horrified and she asked them to take her home. When they drove back to Amanda's house, Melinda kissed Amanda, told her that she loved her, and begged her not to tell anybody what happened. Amanda agreed and promised not to tell anyone and then went back into her house. So that morning on January 11th, 1992, two brothers were driving towards Jefferson Proving Ground to go hunting when they spotted a body on the side of the road. 
By 10.55 a.m., the police were called. Police arrived and started to collect evidence from the scene. Now, their initial thought was that this was a drug deal gone wrong and that this body belonged to someone that was not local to the area. At the same time that this was going on, Shanda's father woke up and realized that Shanda was not home. He had started calling around to different neighbors and different friends all morning, but no one had any idea of where she had gone. So by 1.45 p.m., he called Shanda's mom, Jackie, and they filed a missing persons report with the Clark County Sheriff's Office. Then by 8.30 that evening, both Tony and Hope went to the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office with their parents, and they were both absolutely hysterical. Now, I don't know if they had admitted to their parents what they did or if someone had found out, maybe by seeing blood on one of them or something like that. But either way, when they got to the police station, they admitted pretty much everything that had happened. They told police about Shanda and then gave them the names of the other girls that were involved and described everything that they did to this poor 12-year-old little girl. So then they contacted the Clark County Sheriff's Office and they were able to identify Shanda as the victim by using dental records. By the next day on January 12th, both Melinda and Lori were arrested. At this point, the only evidence that they had was Hope and Tony's statements and they were not giving the media any information beyond that. So I don't know anything really about the trials other than the outcomes for each girl. From the get-go, the prosecution knew that they were going to be trying these girls as adults. However, to avoid the death penalty, they all took plea bargains. Lori and Melinda were both sentenced to 60 years in prison in the Indiana Women's Prison. Hope, too, received 60 years in prison. However, in 2004, Hope appealed her sentence and that was reduced to 35 years. Tony pled guilty to one charge of criminal confinement and was sentenced to a max of 20 years. So during the trial, the abuse that Melinda had suffered at the hands of her father came to light. In 1993, he was charged with rape, sodomy, and sexual battery. However, because of the statute of limitation in Indiana, which is five years, and most of his crimes happened well before that, all of the charges were dropped except for one count of sexual battery. He received a sentence of time served, which was two years, as he was awaiting trial, and then he was released. While Melinda was in prison, she became involved with training service dogs. She apparently was getting pretty good at training, and people were coming to her to seek help for training their more difficult dogs. Jackie saw what Melinda was doing for the Indiana Canine Assistance Dogs program and believed that Melinda was a changed person. She saw her interactions with the dogs and thought that she was very sincere. In 2012, she actually donated a puppy named Angel to Melinda to train for ICANN. Unfortunately, things did not end well for Shanda's father. He actually started using alcohol to cope with the loss and died from alcohol abuse in 2005 at the age of 53. By December of 2000, Tony was released on parole after serving eight years. In April of 2006, Hope was released after serving 14 years and remained on parole for five years. Lori was released in January of 2018 after serving 26 years, and Melinda was released in September of 2019 after serving just over 26 years and is currently on parole. So that is where the case ends, but I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about how all of this happened. So it seems pretty clear that Melinda was the ringleader in all of this. She was driven by jealousy and rage, but surprisingly, she was not the most violent of them all. Lori was the one who actually did most of the beating. She encouraged Melinda through it all. It seemed like the two of them worked the most together to do this horrific act. Then we have Hope. She didn't take much part in actually hurting Shanda, but she taunted her. She sprayed Windex on her. She laughed at her. 
she was younger than Melinda and Lori, so she seemed like she just wanted to impress these older girls by taking some part of it, but not all. And then we have Tony. She didn't harm Shanda at all. She didn't take part in the torture or the taunting. She was the only one who showed any remorse or doubt. She knew it was wrong, so rightfully she went to jail for not doing anything about it, but these older girls were probably very, very intimidating. She could have put a stop to it, but she was probably very afraid. I almost feel for her because what could she have done? She was watching them relentlessly torture this young 12-year-old girl. She may have felt that if she spoke out, that she would meet the same fate. She could have put a stop to it, but she didn't probably because she was terrified. I also know that I am not alone in the thought that Larry got off with basically nothing for basically being the catalyst for Shanda's death. Obviously, it's not just him, but all of the parents of all four of these girls. When it comes to a lot of cases about people being abused and then going on to commit crimes as adults, you can look at the abuse and understand why they did what they did, but it's still their own responsibility as adults to take responsibility for their actions and to learn how to get better and to control their emotions and the difference between right and wrong. An adult can get therapy. An adult can get help when they know they are spiraling. An adult can understand the difference between right and wrong even if they were horrifically abused. But these were teenage girls. Especially Melinda and Lori's parents let them suffer some of the most horrific and disturbing child abuse that a child can possibly go through. They taught their children that the only way to solve their problem is through violence. They were never taught empathy. They were never taught how to deal with their problems in a healthy way. This is all that they knew. I just wish that there was a way to make these parents have more responsibility. They are just as at fault as their teenage daughters. They should receive punishment, but they haven't. Larry spent two years in jail for putting his children through an absolute lifetime of abuse. And that is absolutely ridiculous. Shanda should have never gone through what she went through and I literally wanted to throw up while I was researching it and while I was telling you guys as brutal and horrible as the things I described, I left out a lot of details. I did not want to tell everything that happened because it's so, so horrific, the things that I even did say. I am pissed that Melinda got out of jail after not serving even half of her prison sentence. I'm pissed that Lori got out after not even serving half of her prison sentence. Lori didn't even know this little girl. She just abused her and harmed her because she wanted to. There was no reason that Lori had for wanting to hurt Shanda whatsoever. Yet somehow she got out so early after not even serving half of her prison sentence. And the only reason that she harmed this little girl is because she wanted to. Shanda deserved better. Her parents deserved a lot better. These are the type of things that you want to pretend that don't happen, but they do. Hurt people hurt people. Parents need to do a better job of making sure their children are raised properly. But even more so, we need to do a better job of making sure that parents are doing what they need to do to protect their children. There are reasons that we have certain things in place to protect children from their own parents, but all they do is fail children over and over and over again. If Melinda and Lori grew up in stable homes, I guarantee you that Shanda would still be alive today. But somehow, even after the courts knew what Larry did, even after social workers had gone to Lori's house to see how much she was being abused, everyone was just allowed to live their life. No one had to take any accountability or responsibility for any of this. Nothing was done to help Melinda or any of the girls. They were abused. They were neglected and nobody did anything. So that is where I am going to end today's video. I know that I had a bit of a rant and I honestly could keep going and just keep talking about everything that's wrong with this case, but you guys understand it's so infuriating when children die, when no one has to take accountability for how their children act. It is 
absolutely appalling. It needs to change. But as I say in so many of my videos, and honestly, I hope something changes, but I don't know. I don't know what we can do to change it anymore. These things always happen. They keep happening and nothing is ever done. And the most that I think that we can do is talk about these cases, make their names known and make these cases known and keep talking about them and don't let people forget about the children who die when they really did not have to. But anyways, I'm going to keep ranting if I don't just end the video. Um, you guys know how I can get when um, these type of things happen. So I just wanted to thank you guys so much for watching today's video and for listening to Shanda's story. I know it was a very rough one and one of the most graphic and horrific cases that I have ever talked about on this channel, but I really do not want to be that person that shies away from these topics because they are just not talked about enough. Shanda's story deserves to be told and that's why I am here. But with that, I'm going to end the video. Thank you guys so much for watching. Again, if you enjoyed this video, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put up new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. Make sure to click the link down below and head over to Function of Beauty for 20% off of your unique formula of hair care products that is made just for you. With that, I hope you guys have a great week and I hope to see you next time. Bye.